I want to talk about bunting. In fact, I don't know why it's taken me so long to get around to this subject. I never really thought about it. You would think that a site named smallballsuccess.com, that would be the first thing you might expect to see there. And it just kind of slipped my mind. And the other day I was thinking about our, our new book, Metal Ropes. Kind of proud of that cover because all of my software went on the blink and I had to make this from uh, completely from MS Word. It's just a little bit blurry, but it's still one of my favorite covers because I don't know how I ever succeeded in making it. But it's it's a pretty cool little book, I think, from a lot of respects. And it has yeah, some of the photos on the front are of my guy when he was a little fella playing with the metal bat and everything. And he was, I want to tell you, he was always the best bunter on every team that he was ever on. And that was true even when he was in college, although he never got an official at bat since he was a pitcher and colleges all used the designated hitter. But in practice, he was still, he was far and away the best bunter. And I'm sure that the reason for that was because he is right-handed. He was a pitcher, of course, right-handed but he always batted left-handed he just I guess was imitating me when he was a little bitty fella and just stuck with it he always batted left-handed and one of the things that you need to realize I think about bunting one of the first things is that your bottom hand it seems to me and you'll hear I'm sure different methods of bunting from other people but it seems to me that the bottom hand is the key to the whole thing uh, if that's your better hand, then, you know, you're steering the bat with your good hand there. I don't think the top hand really does anything much, but just serves as, I think I call it in the book there, a kind of a picture hanger. You're just hanging the barrel on the fingers there very loosely. And it's the bottom hand that does all the steering and adjusting. If you're batting right-handed and your better hand is on the top, then this hand, which isn't quite as smart, has to take over the steering wheel. And I think there's a strong tendency in a lot of hitters for this better hand to become too assertive. In fact, I've seen oh, so many kids actually get those fingers out in front and get hit with the ball. You need to get those fingers behind the barrel as much as you can. They're just very loose. The barrel's just... Um, you know, they're kind of hiding behind the barrel, and that's even important because since the barrel is supposed to deaden the ball, you don't want a tight grip up here on the barrel. But all of that stuff is, it takes a lot more practice when this is your good hand and you're turned around with that hand on top. I think guys that are just natural right-handers and are batting left instantly have an advantage the bunting and oh, there are all kinds of topics that I want to do a whole series about this uh, as I was saying that I, I got the idea from the book from remembering a section in the book which is actually about bunting and I think it's a good section although it's not terribly long and I began asking myself well why haven't I done any videos on this um, it's there may be a couple of reasons why in the 21st century we really don't think much about bunting. Of course, we're a home run kind of a culture now. We like the long ball. But I think small ball is uh, at the professional level sort of making a comeback. Even so, even with wooden bats in professional ball, the guys naturally you who are watching this, you probably spent your whole lives playing with metal bats, and if you ever do play professional ball, you're not going to use a bat like this old Robin Ventura or something that has a gentle kind of a taper. You're going to use something that's uh, made like the metal bats that you know from your childhood. And so even professional players today, of course most of them who do the bunting are pitchers in the National League, uh, but even they want a wooden bat that looks like the metal bat that they used in Little League and in high school. So they have something with the skinny little handle and then the 
sudden dramatic flare out in the big thick barrel. Uh, it's probably 31, 32 inches long. And they're taking that up to the plate and trying to bunt with it. It'd be so much better to have something with a thicker, even, you know, thicker than this, a thick handle all the way down, longer, um, very gentle taper. I don't know why in the big leagues, when everybody in the stadium knows that the pitcher's going up to bunt, even when he has two strikes, he's going to strike out trying to get that bunt down. So why does he have this 31-inch bat with the big flare that's not designed for bunting? Why don't they have some bats in the rack that are just for bunting? I'll never understand that. Well, <clears throat> but anyway, you know, because of the inadequacy of the bats, I think, and it, this becomes just so much more true at the lower levels where um, you guys with the metal bats, you're... The metal does not deaden the ball, of course, as well as the wood. And again, kids don't want to be the guy who makes the sacrifice. Okay, you may get a high five when you get back in the dugout, but that's mostly because the coach, did, you know, he did something good. You need to recognize that. I want you other guys to realize this is what, well, you know, kids, now they want to hit the home run. So it's just not being taught the way that it, used to be and uh, the metal flare if the wooden bats are flared in professional ball the metal bats are even more so and it's even harder to bunt with those uh, gosh I didn't realize that the Little League it was watching the Little League World Series this summer and even the metal bats that my son was using when he was in high school they're so much the taper's so much more modest compared to the things now. They just explode into the barrel. And I don't even know that that's very safe to bunt with because it seems to me that, you know, if you have that kind of a taper and you hit the, you, the ball connects where the barrel is really suddenly falling off into the handle the ball hits that section, it could pop right up into your face, which it did the Max Scherzer, among other people, when he was practicing his bunts uh, this past season. I did, those are That's not a good outcome. So we just don't have the tools that we used to, and therefore we don't have the skills because we're not practicing it. So I want to try to uh, talk more about that. You know, when you look back into the dead ball era, as we do with small ball success, you don't really see statistics about sacrifices because they didn't keep them. And it, it makes you kind of scratch your head because, again, you'd think uh, Ty Cobb, Eddie Collins, Tris Speaker, uh, you know, those guys, they must have been master butters, and yet nobody talks about it, and there are no stats for it. Why is that? I think it's because they they didn't actually bunt very often in our sense of the word. Uh, they had all kinds of things that they were doing with the bat that uh, were not full swings. They might kind of sling the barrel at the ball and let go early. Uh, they, of course, were dragging bunts all the time. They were doing something back in the 1890s which came to be called the Baltimore Chop because that old Baltimore team that eventually became the Yankees when they moved to New York, the team that uh, John McGraw was on, they were a scrappy team and they did this thing where they would beat the ball directly into the ground and it would bounce so high that by the time the catcher or somebody got under it to field it, the runner was already just about to touch first base. So in other words, they were, you know, they were advancing runners, but they were doing so in a way that also gave them a good chance to reach first base. The idea of just giving yourself up in a sacrifice, uh, why would you do that? Why would you give up an out? just to get a guy to second base when you could have first and second and no outs. Actually, just a little sidebar, but 
uh, the sabermetrics guys tell us that that's not a very high percentage play if you want to score anyway. The best way to uh, score in an inning is when a guy is on second with no outs, and then you bunt him over to third. But all the more reason to, you know, if the guy's on first and no outs, why can't you do something with the bat that you're pretty sure is going to advance him but also has a good chance to get you to first base? Uh, then let the next guy do the sacrifice. But and especially in an age when all these radical shifts are being employed. I just, I and a lot of other people, I, we just really don't understand it. And this is something that I think is very worthy of being talked about. So let's, we'll do some videos on this. We'll talk about just the more conventional bunting. But you know some of the stances that I like involve the creep of the, you can't really see it with the way I have the camera set up now, but the mobile back foot, I call it, the little hop step or the the crab crawl that you take into the pitch. And when you're doing that, you can, you know, you can, you can either, like Tris Speaker, who used that step and Ed Roush I think probably did too. You can load up and take a good hack at the ball but you can also uh, just keep on going kind of like Ichiro. You can, Ichiro is probably the player that you guys are most familiar with who would uh, do something like this slap bunting while he's racing to first. You can, you can put it in play and get a good head start out of the box when you have that back foot that's uh, moving into the load. Uh, so there are a lot of things with the kind of uh, hitting style that I've already talked about that just naturally feed right into a bunt. And it's, it's I think, going to be really fun to try to build on some of that. So stay tuned.